Hey, hey, welcome back everyone to part three of my team building guide. I've been building to this for a little while now, and today we're gonna to be talking about offensive and defensive cores in Pokemon. This is a really useful strategy for team building, whether you're a newcomer or a pro team builder. And I think it's such a great crutch for learning that to be honest, originally the series was just gonna be like this one video on cores. However, it wasn't until I got into it that I realized that in order to understand what I'm talking about newcomers, are really gonna need the context of what types of teams exist in Pokemon and types of roles that fill those teams. So as a result, this turned into a bit of a whole series instead, and I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. But let's get into it first and answer, what is an offensive and defensive core? And trust me, it's about as simple as it sounds. A core is just a group of two or more Pokemon that work to cover each other's weaknesses. Defensive cores work together so they have a strong Pokemon to switch to no matter what your opponent brings out. And the offensive cores work together so they can break through any wall that your opponent brings against you. And on the surface, that's probably pretty underwhelming. You'd probably be right to think something along the lines of, isn't that how all team building works on Pokemon? Like, what makes this so special? And I mean, really to that, I'd say exactly. Realistically, all offensive teams should work together to smash through all enemy Pokemon's walls. All defensive teams should be impervious to those walls. Again, in theory, in theory, using offensive and defensive cores are just a means to achieve those ends. If I just throw someone in the deep end and say, make a team, that's an awful way to go about it. Every single tier of play has dozens of different Pokemon, often with multiple, very different sets, uh, including Pokemon from nearby tiers as well to worry about. So just tossing someone into all that and saying, okay, like make a team, that would be insane. Imagine all the things you'd have to juggle. Starting with a small, basic core makes the whole process so much easier. Let's say I'm building my first Sword and Shield team, and I want to actually have fun with the process instead of being stressed out. Well, let's say I start with finding a core. Okay, Clefable and Corviknight are a famous defensive core, right? It seems like Corviknight protects Clefable from a lot of scary physical attackers like Exudril or Jirachi or Obstagoon. But the Clefable protects Corviknight from some special attackers like Hydreigons or Chandelures uh, and Keldeo. So awesome, that sounds like a great start for a team. Now that I've got that defensive core, I can ask myself, hmm, what's a Pokemon that threatens this new core of mine? Well, if we look at some common threats, it seems like Dracovish and Rotom Heat have a great matchup versus my young team so far. So now we ask ourselves, how can we build on this core to protect against this new threat? So then I might think, hmm, maybe I'll include a Seismitoad for those. And this process is gonna keep going and going and going until I have a full team. It's just a simple first step that can get you started on your way to building your own teams. However, also consider using this method for learning new tiers. All of my examples so far have been from Sword and Shield overused, but let's say I wanna try it on a new tier, like rarely used, or even Diamond and Pearl overused. So I might ask myself, well, I know very little about this tier, where do I start? Well, thanks to the beautiful world of the Smogon forums, that really isn't gonna be so hard. Okay, so I've just searched DPP offensive cores, and I found this awesome article on Smogon written by Blue and Fuzznip. It talks about Jolteon and Gyarados as a great offensive core. So damn, that seems like perfect, awesome. Uh, and it even goes a step further here and it says its biggest problem is Skarm Bliss defensive cores. And it then recommends that I use a Jirachi to deal with that. So that's great. It's already taken that next step forward on how I can build on this offensive core. So that's a great start. But again, I don't know this tier and I don't really know where I should be going from there to prepare against these threats. So let's wander over to the tier's viability rankings also hosted in the Smogon forums which orders all the tier's scariest Pokemon. So now that we're here, I can go, ah, crap, uh, it looks like a defensive substitute Spore Balloon might cause my team some problems. None of my Pokemon can kill it before it can set up a Spore and set me to sleep. And then it can use Leech Seed and Substitute on me all day and I'll never be able to break through. Well, maybe my team needs a Celebi to help smoke out those Balloons. So yeah, that would be cool. Uh, or hell, maybe even make that a Shaman so I can beat enemy Tyranitars, which uh, Celebi is weak to, and you know, so on and so on. This process is gonna continue. You can see how this team building process is very organic after you find that natural starting point. As long as you're willing to take advantage of all the amazing community resources, this becomes so much less scary and requires so much less work for you to do. Of course, now is also a good time to mention that viability threads and theory are all well and good, but there's really no substitute for good old fashioned in-game testing and personal experience. Uh, at various stages of trying a new team, you should be okay with taking it out onto the ladder, uh, looking for cracks in your new team, and then finding your own ways to patch them up. Again, make sure you don't stress out too much about your wins or losses when you're doing this process, because you're just trying to figure out what your team has problems with, and you're just doing this for like scouting purposes, not for just farming wins or losses quite yet. And actually the final point that I wanna bring up with team building with cores is how great a tool it is for including some lesser used Pokemon. Again, this is one of the main reasons I wanted to make this series of videos so long ago, because so often I see people kind of despondently like, oh man, my favorite Pokemon is Decidueye, but it's in the rarely used here, not overused, so there's no way I can use it. But once again, making use of a core to protect it can be a great way to build around lesser used Pokemon. Let's look at that Decidueye again. So, okay, taking a look at it objectively, it's got, you know, okay bulk, okay attacking stats, mediocre speed, so, hmm, what does it have going for it? 
first thing that jumps out at me is it's very interesting typing because you know who what this typing gives it a great matchup against Excadrill, one of the most common Pokemon in the entire overused tier. So the ghost type, this guy can come in on Excadrill, damn near for free, and block rapid spins. Plus, it's grass typing lets it resist its earthquake in case they predict that. Okay, so yeah, knowing this, I can think of lots of different niches it could fill. It could kind of come in for free on extra drill and set up and try to break some walls that way, or it can make it more of a defensive pivot and again, bring it in and make use of its defog and U-turn and spin blocking to get lots of momentum for other Pokemon on my team. There's lots of things I can do. I could even use this trapping move uh, and start doing some cheese trap sets. There's, there's lots that I can go with it. But for the purpose of this, let's say I want to make use of that defensive pivot set I mentioned. And so now I have to ask myself, what are the biggest problems this Pokemon faces against the rest of the tier? Well, sitting at the top of Sword and Shield's viability thread, I immediately notice a couple of big problems. If my opponent really wants those hazards gone, they can just defog them with Corviknight. Uh, I can also be threatened out by an Aegislash's Shadow Sneak or a Rotom's Overheat. And not to mention that Ferrothorn or Mandibuzz are also going to wall me big time and going to be some big problems to pivot in and out of. So thinking of these problems that this Decidueye has, and I want to find a Pokemon that pairs with it really well and helps kind of patch up some of those flaws it has, the first thing that jumps out at me is going to be a Rotom Heat of my own. That would make a great core with the Decidueye. It can really do a number on all of those threats, and it's also going to appreciate, in reverse, Decidueye's handling of the Moldbreaker Exodrill and Seismitoads and things like that. So again, it's a bit of a double-sided uh, beneficial relationship there. So okay, great, just like that, without even using someone else's core or looking online for that, uh, I've kind of workshopped a great start of my own. So yeah, that's just a basic idea of what I'm looking at there, but I really want to demonstrate that taking advantage of these offensive and defensive cores doesn't reduce the creativity of fun of team building a Pokemon, but in fact, it helps expand it and show you how many possibilities there are and lets you use some of these lesser used Pokemon. So once again, I find it easier to start building around. You have a few core pieces to start with and then you add on to that instead of just like starting completely fresh. Also, this isn't just a crutch for new players either. You can watch like a tippity top player like BKC on his team building videos, for example. Even if he's not explicitly looking for cores on his teams, he's still making use of them. It's just that when he's playing a tier, he knows backwards and forwards like generation three, for example, he knows instinctively what threats he needs to worry about and they can use pre-established cores or brand new cores that he's thinking of on the fly to help answer these threats to his team. Once you start to see teams through this lens, it really helps you understand what makes them tick helps you recognize what the breaking points are. And again, from a building perspective, it just makes everything so much easier and so much more relaxing. And actually one final closing note, all of my examples thus far have been using a two Pokemon core and then adding onto it from there. But really a core can include as many Pokemon as you want. For example, just a basic fire, water, and grass typing core is a classic way to start a lot of team buildings as their synergy works really well together, kind of similar to the steel and fairy synergy that I've mentioned in a couple times in the past. Or right here, this is a pretty classic core of balanced teams in Sword and Shield. Hell, half of my teams in black and white start with this sand offense core or shell, call it what you want. Although I was recently told that I should have a Rotom wash on this shell, so maybe not a complete core right there, but again, you get the idea. It's just important you can keep in mind that these cores can have as many Pokemon as you want, so then you can build on it from there. But yeah, cores are a great way to find the fun in Pokemon team building. If you've joined me for this whole team building series so far, thank you so much. Next time for the fourth and final full episode of this series, I'm gonna combine everything we've learned so far to build a team live and show you a thorough process of team building for competitive play. However, before we get to that, I've also recorded a couple of amazing interviews with two top players where we focus on taking team building from a casual level up to top level play. I'm really excited to see how they go and see what you guys think about them. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and if you wanna stay tuned for that actually, uh, make sure you subscribe and hit that bell icon. It's an old cliche, but it really does help the channel as does likes and comments and all that jazz. Uh, but thanks once again for watching the video. I'll see you next time.